I'm a big fan of doing your homework and really understanding what you're talking about. But at the end of the day, it has to be field tested and ultimately within a client's court. Folks, hire us for our skills so that we can do our job. So if we don't get gigs or on any gigs, then what use is all this that we are learning? So today I want to show you a system design and tuning from start to finish within the context of a real life project. I was hired to go up to Reading, Pennsylvania to serve a church up there. The client was awesome. His name was Edward. He's actually a student of mine in one of my courses. I want to give him a shout out. He was great to work with, but I wanted to show you from start to finish what that looked like from him reaching out, uh, me gathering data, putting together the system design. Then it was actually quite a bit of time that had to pass between when the rig got installed, I was able to come out and tune it. They had a local integrator kind of get it in the ballpark and then I finished it up. So you're going to be seeing both the planning, the actual design, it getting implemented and then me coming out and tuning it at the end. And I'm um, so the back half of the video is going to be walking around me seeing the aftermath of, of the before and after the smart data, getting to see some of the venue. So I'm excited to share all of that with you. So if you would like to have access to all of those resources, it's available at the link below for free. So it's the, it's the design walkthrough video. So this is what I actually gave Edward to walk him through the design once I actually finished it. These are the design assets. So he had a Dropbox folder with all these pictures in it and me guiding you through what was going on. You also have the VRX LAC design file and the system report. These were JBL VRX boxes that we ended up hanging. That's what they had. You get the audio architect file, the finished file after I tuned in the amps, and you get the smart traces. So you're able to see the data before and after as I was tuning it. Anyway, so excited to share that with you. So let's jump right into the, the, the beginning of the project, how we interact with Edward. We'll step through the design, and then I'll show you on site what everything looked like. First, let's take a look at my project file and how I manage things. I was able to have a checklist of basic things to do and then get info from, from Edward on our call. So first thing was have a first call, send Edward some room data questions after our call, then get the data back. And then I was gonna make the design. And then lastly, get the clarification on the hang points so we were actually gonna hang the speakers in a different spot finalize the design and gather deliverables. And then I was gonna film a video and give it to him with an overview and then deliver the design, get approval on it, and then shoot him an invoice. So that's the project in a <laughs> quick uh, fashion, but here's it in a little bit more slow motion. So here are the inputs. On our first call, I wanted to ask him, tell me more about your church. What do you want to accomplish? What's your budget? Is it small or large? So what he told me is they already have speakers and there's a few other projects going on that COVID delayed. So it's things were kind of up in the air. They already bought the 932 LA passive speakers. So that's what we're going to have hanging in the air. So this was this picture is a bunch of pictures he had sent to me the previous rig that was hanging here, just a couple of point sources. So we're going to both change the location of it and hang four VRX 932 LA, their passive boxes per side. He had the rigging hardware and everything. They have prayer services throughout the week. Tuesday and Thursdays are no music. Friday's a little bit less formal, but Sundays are full band and they have six vocals. So vocal intelligibility and also being able to hear the sermon is really key. There's no sound damping in this building uh, yet or anything. So I, I wanna see if I can keep as much sound on the audience away from the walls. And he needed a design done by December 17th. And this was last year. Again, a lot, a lot of time passed between I, when I finished the design, it got in, installed, then I was able to come out and tune. But anyway, so here's the room, pictures and data. So when I said, hey, Edward, can you take a bunch of pictures of the room and send me some measurements? This is what I got back. So some great shots here up under looking at this speaker. I see those little lanterns hanging there. I'm noting that this is a side view. Now this is up from the stage. I asked him to see that kind of looking out into the room, how deep things were. There's no seating up on this portion, but this is front of house right here. So you're mixing in that little booth up on the stage. This is looking to the side where that speaker's hung and going down some more to the other side. Again, really cool stained, stained glass building. They were also using these KW-153s down front as well in addition to these. So since they've now changed, obviously. Look at the room again. Okay, you're, you're getting the picture. This is just really helpful data to kind of help orient myself in the room since I was doing this remotely and more pictures. So then he sent me this with some detailed measurements in inches. So it shows me the stage width, the room depth, room depth, room width. Anyway, 
and then tell me where the singers usually sing. So this green box he drew out for me is basically my coverage square where I needed to, to cover. So the very front row to the back. And this told me, hey, we can do two hangs for these two different zones. And if we draw an X across these, that gives us our zone in our middle. So I said, hey, these are our two zones. Let's hang the speakers here and shoot them down the middle. I know that's quite isn't super straight, but anyway, that was the general idea is have them on axis in the middle of those zones for them to cover. So they already bought the boxes in advance, so I couldn't change coverage. I just said, hey, what is the best way to use what we got? And we're going to shoot down the middle of those zones. And then he gave me trim height to the top there. And I said, okay, what if... If we divide these in half, just roughly looking from the back of the room here, we're gonna have to move in a little bit. So I just went up and said, hey, this looks like about where we're gonna need to hang things. So later on the call, I, I got a detailed equipment list, the eight GBL VRX, the array frames, and he has four Crown XTI four, uh, 4002s. So we're gonna be able to do all the tuning in the amps, which is nice, because we have two outputs per amp, so we don't have to do any of the passive array uh, I forget what they call it for JBL, but you can do plus three, zero, or minus three on the HF on the horn. So we're going to leave them all at zero and then do all of our EQing or HF shading in the amps. And for our subs as two KS-118s. So anyway, this is the rest of the email he gave me on the elevation of the room. I put that in there. So this is the template I used to request data from him. So this is, I said, hey, here, give me the equipment list. Give me the subs, the power amps, the fly bars. Do you got them? Give me the lengths, width, and height, the distance of the stage to the first row. Do we still have access to the 153s? Where can we put the subs? And this is the data he provided me and did a great job. I think he did a really great job with this very detailed photo showing me where everything is. So hats off to Edward for giving me great data on the front end. Okay, so here were the outputs. I then turned around and gave him this asset that you now have access to at the link below, this walkthrough video. So I was able to basically walk through all these design assets that are here and me talking it through to him. This also had a transcript. The tool I'm using here is called Descript. You can take a video, Descript, sorry. You upload it to Descript and you can edit there and send them a link and they can preview it. So it's great. So this is what he had. And I was able to show him the design file and everything. And this is what we ended up with. And he had access to this Notion page as well. So I said, hey, we can gonna line up with the second step. The, pink, the green circle shows where it's going to hang from. And the pink arrow it hanging down and showing that's the symmetry of the room where we're going to hang them in. And we can get more detailed uh, with placement in a bit. But that's basically me showing him how I wanted things done. Where's my outputs back to him? So now let's jump into VRX LAC and look at the design file itself. So we had four of the 932 LA ones. Those are the, the, the passive versions. And I put in our one degree elevation. So a slight uh, elevation in the back here and ended up being, I think, 35 feet deep. Uh, from hanging from that second step. So that's how I measured and put it there. I put a probe here at the front, the middle and the back. And this is how I fine tuned the angles. I know it looks like I'm wasting this box back here, but don't forget that we have front of house back there. And I'm not only concerned with just the top end, having that fourth box helps me bring low mids uh, a little bit more focus since we have a longer line length and we have more SPL available to us. And uh, we're having four, we don't absolutely have to have a front fill at this point. So we can have it all in the air and keep the stage clean. So with a lot of steps and having to like drill into stuff and put small speakers in, I don't like that. So in these types of setups where there's a lot going on on the stage, if we can get it on the air, that's a bonus. So this was my vertical aiming in the VRX LEC software. We had it, let's see, as far as placement in the air, I had it... 23 feet and then I had the uh, at a 17.5 degree down tilt and I was most concerned with getting this equal having this where it's the same coverage shape at all frequencies or as close to it as I can 
So I could have done some shading here to maybe get my top end to match a little bit better. I think if I maybe did here, uh, I actually I need a boost down there on the bottom box. But anyway, actually leaving them all at zero, I can get them follow all the same trend and then we can see in the smart data and verify on site, did, I actually, did my design actually hold up? And that's the thing. It, this is all just pretty pictures, unless in the field, does it sound good? And does the data show me that it worked? All right, with that, I'm gonna trans transition over to a video that I took on site where I'm walking through the entire rig. So I'm showing you the room, the console, my uh, amp control, how I was able to do the tuning there, where I placed my microphone. So this isn't me tuning in real time, but it's me looking after the fact and saying, hey, did this design actually work out? Here we are at our venue, as we can see super cool uh, old church, beautiful stained glass here in Reading, Philadelphia. Anyway, we have, let's do first the rig walkthrough, then we'll go to the console and processing and, and step through what's going on. So our two hangs are a VRX left and right array. There are four boxes in their array. Then we got two subs. They're hidden here right in front of the drum cage, QSC KS-118s, the one on the side. Couldn't put them in the center because of the stage, didn't want to block pathways, so here they are on the sides. And walking through here, the main seating area is pews. Sorry, I'm still getting used to this Osmo thing, but it should look better than a GoPro. I've got mics set out that were my mic positions. I feel like the Red Hot Chili Peppers at the Super Bowl because I don't have them plugged in. But this is mic uh, B, there's mic C, and mic D down at the front. These are placed basically in front of each box. I do have an output per box, which is nice. So I can do individual EQ and shading on the amps, and then do the macro processing at the console. There wasn't a system processor, so that's what we did here. So just wanna show you what's going on down here. That's mic C, here mic D, pointed right up here at the cabinets. And here is our trusty subwoofer, the KS-118. I have it gassed all the way up to get up to the mains level, have it on 100 hertz crossover and the deep setting, which I like on these boxes. So moving on here, this is a look from the stage, looking out, get this guy to rotate. Again, really, really cool room. This is looking back. So that's our front of house. And this is on axis with the boxes as they are looking out. So that is, let's see, I'll be able to get it, yeah. They're looking out uh, past what's going on, out straight forward. And back here is the amps. Let's show you those. Okay. So here is the amp closet and the Crown CDI 4000s. And I've done a custom uh, preset on all of those, left top, left bottom. So we have Left channels the top box, right channels the second box, then left, third box, fourth box. Same thing on these two. So that's what our processing is. So now let's jump back to front of house and see what we have going on there. We'll show you a fun little peculiar thing of like, here's my A microphone back at front of house. Then if I turn here, come on, you can do it. Here is my A microphone. As you can see, the mix position is perfectly blocked by these chandeliers, so that's not fun. So of course, we're getting less high frequencies at front of house. We can't gas and overcome of it because that would affect some people down here, but just something to take note of that it's probably best to mix down on the floor with an iPad for this gig or just account for it in your brain. We're on the Allen Heath SQ7. I had the left-right mix no processing, processing on it, but sent to two stereo matrices. So I have mains, and sorry, that's blown out, but that's mains and subs. Mains is right here. Here's the EQ we ended up going with, high pass filter at 100 hertz. And same thing with the subs, the low pass filter, a little bit of low mid dip, and then our low pass way up top. Then sub, EQ, I had this stereo matrix because we have separate left and right subs and we had the real estate and processing, so why not? And I just had a little bit of a dip at 72 hertz. That's that processing there. Then walking back over, we had this machine mounted with all four amps on 
this uh, alt plugged in. So reviewing EQ wise, I'm able to do top end EQ shading on each box. So this is channel one, channel two of main left top. So this is box A or the top one on the left side and box B on the right side. I like to take care of the system EQ basically below 1K or where we don't, we have a bunch of overlap between the boxes 1K and below uh, across the entire thing. So that's why I was done at the matrix and I was fed into each amp. Now I'm doing high frequency shading per each mic at each zone. So if I look at that here in smart, there's my target trace. I'll drive my own machine now. And here is the mains left, just the VRX pre-tuning. So we weren't too far, because, and uh, so that means I did a decent job with the design, which needed to fine tune what was going on here. So it's A, B, C, D on the right-hand side, those colors match up. So A, again, not surprised, a bunch of HF drop off because we're farther than each and we had those daggum lanterns in the way. So that was where I started. But before I did that, I went through and verified each box. So we actually got up in a lift. We just took it out of the room, but we got in a lift and on each side, put a microphone about six feet away and sprayed each box just to make sure it was doing well and what we wanted. And those traces are all here. And so left A, left C, and so on and so forth. And they were all good. But then I came to right D. So let me compare right D, the bottom box, compared to right C. And we see it's a uh, polarity inverted. So that means it got wired backwards. So we were simply able to apply a polarity inversion in the software on the output right here to account for that. So that's why it always pays to check each of your boxes, do it twice, do it if you can with everything on the ground first, going directly into it, place a microphone on the ground. I got a video on that on the channel. And then do it again with a microphone if you're able to in the air or at least on the ground so that you can check to see if the actual cabling in the full path, there's something wrong. There may not be something wrong with the box, but the actual path in the install may have done something there. So. I captured that and then applied later the polarity inversion to make it all right. So that is, I verified. We already looked at where we started. So then I moved on to the macro EQ. So that is mains left post macro EQ. So that was me applying the high pass filter at 100 hertz and the gentle low mid, I think I did 300 hertz down 3 dB EQ of one or so, maybe 0.7. And then I applied here up top the low pass filter way up here. So then I just needed to fine tune it and bump it into place with some high frequency shading. And that's when I went here and this is main left post the shading. And that I was able to bring them more into alignment. Again, not a whole lot we can do at front of house here with that microphone, but just wanted to see how it translated. And these are what the filters look like. So this is the top left. Uh, so mains left, the top box, the second box over here on the right, and then I didn't do anything on the third box. Then I shaded down with a high shelf on the very bottom box. So again, not having to manhandle the system, I got it right in the design first, and then moved on to EQ. So I copied this over to right, and then verified to put microphones out. So I moved all my microphones, same positions over to the right. And again, similar EQs here and almost exact same. I think I did bring down a little bit more of 4K on the bottom there. And we can see those traces here with, oops, sorry, wrong mouse, mains right. And I included the sub on the side. I just had one sub on and that's how I got it to the trace. And that's how I got that level. And this is all of it. Was it normalized? Yeah, here, so here's it not normalized, and that's where I got to on each of those four microphones. Again, just sad story here at front of house, but we can always take an iPad and go for a walk and listen to the room. So then again, that's at those four positions. Here is A here at the back, B, C, and D correspond with these four traces. And I place them there because that's where these constant curvature array boxes are pointing. I don't have variable splay, but I do have HF isolation for each of these zones. And that's where I place the microphones, each of those zones. And I, even though 
this is a you know a good 6 dB down or so. I do I did trace normalize these at 1K, which I'll try to do here one-handed. And I did get the tonality to match. So even though it is down on level, we can trust that the tone is the same. And I'm okay with a little bit of drop off above 8K above that because I don't want the very high frequencies to feel so close and jarring this far back in the room that kind of messes with you psychoacoustically. But that was the rig. So to recap, four boxes of VRX, separate amp outputs, placed microphones directly in front of where each of these boxes were pointing on axis with the box, had the system software set up to have control over the HF, basically above 1K to use shelf to match. I did the macro EQ of the rig first, and I did that across here on the console since we didn't have a system processor across a matrix. I took care of high pass filter, uh, a 3 dB dip, it looks like at 290 or 2.5 two dB, a little bit of sub EQ. Oh, and I aligned mains and subs right here at the back of the room. And I actually didn't have to do anything because the propagation delay was really similar. So that's that. Okay, quick run through through this whole rig, the entire process. Again, it started with a good design and I was able to fine tune it in the field and get really good results and the rig sounds great. All right, that was a lot. That was the, the design file, working through the project itself, me verifying that all my system tuning and design decisions actually worked. And I'm happy to say the rig sounded great and the data shows for it. So uh, it, it pays to do your homework and, and then be able to show this to your client as well. They can hear that it sounds good, but if they see that like, hey, this is actually doing what I said I was going to do, that gives them confidence and is really helpful. Again, if you want access to all of the design files and the walkthrough, you can get that at the link below in my audio toolkit. We'll love to share that with you. Uh, I would love for you to leave a comment below with the recent project you've been on where you were able to verify what was going on. Did it work? Work? Did it not work? Is, is this feel scary to you to have to use your measurement data to back up your earlier decisions? Anyway, let me below. My name is Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you next time.